Next, on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show, here's Ryan O'Neill. He writes for townhall.com. He works at Alfred State College. You write for a number of uh, uh, prestigious magazines and online newspapers. He's Dr. Nick Waddy. Dr. Waddy, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Brian. Well, uh, Dr. Nick Waddy, uh, this day in history, this is a big one. Uh, B.E. Day in 1945, Victory Over Europe Day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it sort of speaks for itself. It's the biggest war in human history by far, uh, measured, you know, however you want to measure it. And it ended in May of 1945 with a complete victory by the Allies. And, of course, it's always important not just that a war ends, but how it ends. We girded ourselves as a nation like never before, and we achieved our goal. Another big day in history, 1984. The Soviets uh, announced they were not going to come to the Los Angeles Olympics. Why was that? Was that just because Reagan was the president? Essentially, it's politics and it's retaliation for the U.S. decision not to attend the Moscow Olympics in 1980. Personally, I believe that both of those decisions were a mistake. I like to, to, I like to think that the Olympics are non-political, and I think when people begin to, to uh, you know, undertake these political boycotts, it's, it's unfortunate for the athletes in particular who train very hard. They only get the chance to compete every four years. So in 1984, um, the Winter Olympics were in Sarajevo, and I remember that. They were, they were quite successful. Later on, I would uh, get a chance to visit Sarajevo, a fascinating city. And then in the summer of 1984, the Olympics were in Los Angeles, and it was fairly predictable that uh, the communist bloc countries would follow the lead of the Soviet Union and boycott. But uh, the one exception was Romania. Romania was a very communist country in the Warsaw Pact, but it decided uh, to do its own thing and to show up uh, at Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, I remember very vividly the, the huge ovation that the Romanian athletes got. So um, yeah, it was an interesting moment in the Cold War. Dr. Nick Wadi, uh, moving on to uh, current events. One thing, um, and before before uh, we will get to the Papadopoulos and Clapper and all that, but you know, one thing you hear the conservatives say a lot is that President Trump has given us a great economy. Uh, the response from the liberals, and this has been for over a year now, that that the liberals have been saying this, is that the great economy is a result of the President Barack Obama policies. So, which is it? Who's right there? <laughs> Well, the truth is that everyone's wrong because it's the American people who deserve credit for the American economy, and overwhelmingly, it's not the President of the United States that determines the strength of the economy. It's it's you and me. But there's no question, I, I think, that um, since President Trump became President, the economy has picked up. Growth rates are up. Uh, unemployment rates are down. The stock market is way up. And um, could that be a result of Obama? Well, it, that's pretty hard to say, pretty hard to claim because it's a very delayed reaction. Obama was president for eight years and the economy recovered from the Great Recession. He achieved growth rates of around 2% and he was very satisfied with that. But Donald Trump came, became president and he believed he could do better. He, could believe, he believed he could get us to 3% or better and he has. So I don't think there's any question that the economy has reacted positively to the Trump presidency. And not every indicator is better, but the vast majority of them are. So I think Donald Trump can claim credit for that. And, you know, people have always said that when the economy is strong, that's something that the president can run on and it makes him hard to beat. And ordinarily that would be true. But of course, the uh, the media is trying to break all the rules and to suggest that uh, America is in crisis and, and the American people should decisively reject President Trump. And we'll see if they succeed in that. How about the idea of investigating the investigators? This is something that uh, is being seriously discussed in Washington, uh, investigating the investigators who looked into President Donald Trump and the supposed uh, Russian collusion theory. 
Mm-hmm. Well, it's not just being talked about, it's being done. The Inspector General of the Department of Justice is looking into how some of these uh, investigations began. Uh, as you alluded to, there's quite a bit of discussion about George Papadopoulos and the fact that um, apparently claims about he suggested to someone at some point in some fashion that the Russians might have dirt on Hillary Clinton. And this was exploited um, uh, to begin an, uh, an intelligence inquiry and an FBI investigation in the, into the Trump campaign. And ultimately, as we know, that would be immensely important because it would threaten uh, uh, the integrity of the 2016 election and the integrity of the Trump presidency. And, you know, as, as we investigate these things, it is certain that George Papadopoulos really didn't know anything about anything. And the claims about his claims were misleading. And the people who were doing the claiming were often uh, uh, people who had clear conflicts of interest, who were very closely tied to the Clintons. So um, whether crimes were committed in the beginning of the Trump-Russia hoax remains to be seen. And as I've said, I certainly think we need to get to the bottom of it. But irregularities are certainly there, and they need to be investigated. On George Papadopoulos, who you talked about uh, in your answer there, Dr. Wadi, uh, what do you make of this um, uh, allegation from George George Papadopoulos that he was set up in a perjury trap? Mm-hmm. Um, well, George Papadopoulos, Papadopoulos may have been set up on multiple occasions. I, th- I think there's quite a bit of evidence that the initial FBI and intelligence community interest in Papadopoulos was based on um, their own agents perhaps planting this idea in his head uh, that the Russians had dirt. He repeats it to you know, maybe someone at the FBI or someone in the CIA, then they use that to initiate this investigation. Now, was he also entrapped by Mueller uh, or people on Mueller's team? I don't know. I don't know the answer to very many of these questions, which is exactly why we need a, a thorough investigation. Inspector General is a good start, but the Inspector General is not a prosecutor. And to get real answers, I think, like Mueller, we're going to have to um, shake the tree. We're going to have to use the, uh, the stick of potential prosecution to get people to tell the truth. It's amazing what uh, is being said on Twitter this week. George Papadopoulos uh, put out a tweet about James Clapper saying, quote, Clapper is an imbecile. Not only did he outsource spying on me to the Italians, British, and Australians, and then involve the CIA, but Clapper admits on CNN that this was normal. The most disturbing part about all this is that I was being spied on for ties to Israel. Dr. Wadi, your thoughts on that statement? Well, I think the most disturbing part about all of this is that the U.S. government was essentially spying on a presidential campaign of the opposing party on a very thin pretext. And, you know, it's kind of obvious that this is an immensely dangerous precedent for American democracy. If you can weaponize the FBI or the CIA or the NSA and use it against your political opponents and claim that it's patriotic to do so, I mean, where does that leave American democracy? So. It, as you know, it all goes back to what Bill Barr said before Congress. There are times and there are reasons uh, for spying. Uh, sometimes that can be legitimate. It has to be predicated, as Bill Barr put it. And w- were these things done appropriately and by the book? Um, that's the question. Here's what Rush Limbaugh recently said about uh, Devin Nunes and Nunes pressing the issue about the uh, Trump dossier being flimsy evidence in the only case they had. Devin Nunes single-handedly is the person who exposed for once and all that the dossier is all they ever had on Donald Trump. It's the only thing they used at the FISA court to get their warrants. 
It's all they ever had. It was Devin Nunes who enabled all the rest of us to say with great confidence that Mueller was appointed and shows up at his office and asks Comey for the investigative file and opens it, and there's nothing in it. They never had a shred of evidence on any of this. And it's Devin Nunes and his dogged pursuit which has revealed this. Dr. Wadi. Well, I think they never had a shred of solid evidence, but in addition to the dossier, they had George Papadopoulos, and actually I think his his role in this might be quite central. And he may have been a dupe, he may have been framed, he may have been set up, and if that's the case, you know, that's that's a conspiracy to subvert justice, and we need to, we need to know about that. Um, I agree with Rush in the main that, that the evidence to support this Trump-Russia conspiracy theory was always immensely weak. Uh, and that's what's scary, that you can, you can essentially start an FBI investigation or a CIA investigation at the drop of a hat, it seems, as long as the target is someone who the, the, the people involved don't like, and they certainly didn't like Donald Trump. Dr. Wadi, another person who's been doing a lot of talking lately is uh, Hillary Clinton. Hillary recently made a statement about, and this isn't uh, exact, but basically what she said is you could be the best candidate, you can win, and still have the election stolen from you. Mm. Yeah, that's that's dangerous talk. Uh, I think people like Hillary Clinton and Stacey Abrams who claim that uh, that they're the real winners and and that the election uh, that that resulted in their defeat was illegitimate. They're they're treading on very dangerous ground because they're casting American democracy itself into doubt. And you know, people talk all the time about how irresponsible supposedly uh, Donald Trump's rhetoric is, and how he's embarrassing us on the international stage. How does it look to the world when the loser of our presidential election says? That the election was stolen. How does it look to the world when the media and the Democratic Party say for two years that the president is a traitor and is working for the Russians? Uh, they, they're doing serious damage not only to our international reputation, but also to the basic integrity of our institutions. It's profoundly irresponsible. Hillary Clinton lost the election, and she should accept that. You know, I saw something else Hillary Clinton said this week that I, I kind of agree with. She may be on to something here. Uh, she was talking about um, something going on in Florida. She says no one should have their right to vote taken away from them because of fines. The Florida Republicans measure requiring people to pay court-ordered fees before, before regaining access to the ballot is a modern-day poll tax. What do you think, Dr. Wyatt? I, I agree with her. What do you think? Mm, I don't really agree because it basically you've committed an offense, you've committed a felony, and um, you're essentially paying the costs of your trial or something along those lines. It's pay paying restitution. I, I do think that when you've committed a felony, I'm not convinced that you should get the right to vote back. But if you do get the right to vote back, I don't think it should be automatic. I think you should have to go through some sort of application process or demonstrate good character or make financial restitution uh, or, you know, compensate the victims of your crime in some way. I, I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, so I would disagree that that's, that's a violation of, of people's democratic rights. Dr. Wadi, you just disagreed with the host and we have to take a break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll be back after this. Finding great candidates to hire can be like, well, trying to find a needle in a haystack, but not with ZipRecruiter. Its powerful technology actively finds and invites qualified candidates to apply to your job. That's why four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. So while other companies might deliver a lot of hay, ZipRecruiter finds you the needle in the haystack. Try ZipRecruiter now for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash search. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash search. Checking in now with meteorologist Rob Carolyn. Rob, is the sun shining where you are? 
It is Mr. O'Neill. In fact, it is a beautiful morning across much of the Northeast. A little bit of cloudiness out there this morning from Detroit uh, through Jamestown out to about Albany and then down across southern New England. This is some trailing cloudiness with cold front that moved through yesterday. It's what brought us the rain. System's going to move a little further south today, Brian. Stall out, and then it will start to lift back towards us as a warm front. Got a big storm system developing in the central United States. Lots of energy out there. I don't know if you saw the story about over a foot of rain falling in the Houston area yesterday. Uh, that storm system is going to send some moisture our way, resulting in some rain for Thursday night and Friday. Today, though, we look good. We're partly sunny. We're 60 to 65. Sunrise this morning was at 556. It sets tonight at 818. We'll turn cloudy tonight as the clouds in Pennsylvania come back at us. Lows overnight 40 to 45. Tomorrow, cloudy day. Turns warmer. There's the chance for a shower or a thunderstorm. Highs will be 65 to 70. Scattered showers may be a thunderstorm tomorrow night. Lows 55 to 60. And Brian, Friday looks cloudy with rain and thunderstorms. 70 to 75. We should turn partly sunny, though, for Saturday. If you need time to take a break when you disagree with the host, uh, back with Elfman State History Professor uh, Dr. Nick Wadi. Uh, you wrote on your website, uh, wadiisright.com, that the Nick Sandman lawsuit against the big media corporations might be the only answer uh, to the problem of corporate media making all kinds of wild accusations against people who are not public figures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because these big media organizations are capitalist businesses. They're about making money. And ultimately, they despise Republicans, they despise conservatives, they despise President Trump, and quite a few of them despise America, quite frankly. And they're not going to stop doing any of those things, and they're not going to stop engaging in uh, irresponsible journalism until it threatens their bottom line and until it threatens their jobs and their profits. And um, Nick Sandman is essentially suing them for defamation of a sort. Uh, saying that their their coverage of that incident was so irresponsible that they owe him lots of money. Is he going to win that case? I suspect he's not because defamation is very difficult to prove in this country. But just the threat of uh, those kinds of lawsuits and those kinds of financial losses might cause media organizations to think twice about uh, engaging in irresponsible reporting. The other thing that might work, of course, is, is to threaten their corporate sponsorships. And it amazes me that many major corporations in the United States of America are running commercials on shows that uh, are spinning uh, the most outlandish conspiracy theories about the president of the United States. And there are no consequences for that. There should be. Dr. Wadi, on the issue of polls, I want to ask you what you think of this. Sean Hannity was talking on his radio show yesterday about the polls and how wrong they've been in uh, recent elections even. The exit polls showed that Donald Trump didn't win. And he's talking about 2016 here. The exit polls showed that Donald Trump didn't win a state. And just like 2004, it showed John Kerry was going to be the next president. And I don't think this president in particular polls very well just... Uh, just by virtue of the fact, I don't think, I, I think a lot of people are like, we're not, you, you don't ask me your nosy questions who I'm voting for. It's none of your business. Dr. Wadi. Well, I have to disagree with Sean because I think there are, certainly are polls out there that are biased and that are flawed. But the truth is that every election is a new election and, and all polls are guesswork. But you know, the evidence is in 2016, the polls said that Hillary Clinton was going to win the popular vote by something like three or four points. She ended up winning it by two points. So those polls were not far off. And in, in 2018, the polls, the average of the polls suggested the Democrats were going to win the popular vote in the House by about nine points. And that's pretty much what they did. So, uh, you know, I don't like a lot of these polls, and I don't like many pollsters, and I do think there are ways in which they can be dishonest, frankly, with the polling information they have. But as a whole, I think you know, pollsters are pretty good at predicting um, public opinion and uh, election outcomes, so I don't think we can discount polls. Attorney General, New York State Attorney General Tish James, she's filing a lawsuit against the IRS in order to get Trump's taxes. Uh, the Attorney General of New York State says the IRS has been dragging their feet on this. 
and that they did not answer her uh, request for Trump's tax info in the uh, allotted amount of time. The Treasury Department, though, says there's no valid reason to be asking for this information. What do you make of this one? Well, I think the law says that uh, uh, um, every American has the right to the privacy of their tax returns, and uh, they shouldn't be turned over willy-nilly to people who are engaging in, you know, her basically on a political fishing expedition. So I think that's reasonable. But what comes to my mind is I don't know why um, uh, the New York Attorney General doesn't simply contact the Department of Finance in New York State and get Donald Trump's state tax return. I would think she would have much better access to that and it would probably tell her almost everything that his federal return would tell him, tell her. So um, I'm not sure why she doesn't go that route. Dr. Wadi, down to the last uh, couple of minutes, uh, was there anything I did not bring up that you wanted to talk about? Well, I would like to mention China because uh, it looks like uh, we're very close to either a breakdown in talks, trade talks with China, or to the conclusion of an agreement. It looks like the Chinese are, are um, um, trying to wiggle out of some of their commitments that they've made in the in the course of these trade talks to date and they're trying to seal a better deal for themselves at the end and President Trump isn't having any of it. He's threatening them with uh, uh, tariffs at the end of this week. New tariffs, more tariffs. So it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out. My guess would be that in the next several weeks there's going to be a really big trade agreement between the U.S. and China that will uh, represent a huge victory for President Trump and for this country. Um, but it's a moment of high drama, and we'll just have to wait and see how it turns out. Dr. Wadi, uh, that's it for this show. Oh, I want to thank you for joining us uh, today, and uh, every week, always good having you on. Thank you, Brian. It's an honor and a pleasure.